it was a kind of a sobering event in terms of that you realize, well, some bad things can't happen. Helena Fire Department. Uh, there's a train collision on uh, Benton Avenue, or a train blew up or something on Benton Avenue. How long ago did you hear it? Just now. All of a sudden, there was this huge bang. Thing, wow, what was that? That, that was something big could have been extremely dangerous, we just didn't think about it. There are some materials on there that are hazardous. Pull everybody back if you can, especially if it's on fire. Okay, we had a railroad car explode down here, possible toxic. Got orders to evacuate everyone for half a mile. 30 years ago this weekend, people across Helena were jolted awake by a massive explosion. The blast was triggered when a train derailed near the Benton Avenue crossing. Windows at Carroll College were blown out, half of the city without power, and pieces of metal weighing hundreds of pounds were sent flying through the air. Over the next half hour, you'll hear from the first responders who raced to the scene, a survivor who worked for the railroad, and members of the community left cleaning up. The 1989 Helena train explosion was, by all accounts, the largest disaster in Helena of the modern era. First responders, just like many Helena residents, were jolted from their warm beds on that frigid February morning, not knowing what had happened. Despite the fact that information was hard to come by initially, those responders headed out the door, whether they were on shift or not. I was awakened by an explosion. First I checked to see if we had any holes in the wall, then I turned the radio on. I got up and looked out the window and I saw a fireball down towards Carroll College area and all the power went out in the house and I turned to my wife and I said, I think I'm going to work. Stations one and two, I'm paging on your main channel with no response. So I kind of look around and it's dark throughout the valley. I can't see anything anywhere. Can you please respond to Benton Avenue near Carroll College railroad tracks? We've had some kind of an explosion. We do not know exactly what the problem is at this time. It wasn't too long after that I received a call from the uh, dispatch center telling me that a uh, train had uh, exploded. Uh, at the uh, Benton Crossing by Carroll College and uh, they believe that hazardous materials were aboard. It's a moment still fresh in the minds of the emergency workers called to respond February 2nd, 1989. Current Helena Police Chief Troy McGee was then a sergeant, current Lewis and Clark County Sheriff Leo Dutton an EMT. J.R. Foyt and Steve Larson were firefighters, and Paul Spangler was Lewis and Clark County's Disaster and Emergency Services Coordinator. Spangler's first order of business that day was opening an emergency operations center to gather and disseminate information. Uh, I uh, uh, pumped out press releases. This is the old days with uh, typewriters, I recall, and I had messengers uh, in the emergency operations center to hand carry them to the uh, radio stations. For the others, they discovered their purpose when they arrived on the scene. Dutton was directing Carroll students to safety. At that time, at that moment, I remember watching them come across there and looking in my face for hope, looking in my face that, is it okay? Just trying to keep people out of the area, trying to ascertain what this what was in the rail cars? Did we need to evacuate people? What streets did we need to block off? The scene was chaotic, complicated by a number of factors. So the main station had no power. It had no heat. Uh, temperatures dropping in that building as well as other buildings. But also, we were, uh, we were starting to receive calls from dispatch from other instances that were starting to happen around the city. Much of those other calls were residents concerned about the combination of the frigid cold and lack of power, conditions that only added to what first responders were battling. At those temperatures, our masks were just, were just frozen solid. The, the exhalation valves were frozen. I thought, I thought I'd dress for the weather, but there, it was very difficult to dress for that weather. Responders made sure that no residents were harmed and miraculously, there were no serious injuries. Other than minor scrapes and bruises, I think that the students were going through, probably if you talk to them now, what would be the mental uh, part 
and we didn't even consider that back then. There was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts and metal flying over buildings and going through buildings, and nobody got hurt. Nobody got killed. It's simply amazing. Those we interviewed say there is one common theme that stands out in reflecting on that day 30 years ago. I mean, you get a big emergency like that, and the citizens work together, the fire department works, and the police department works, and the sheriff's office, and there's so many people out there that come together. You know, it could have been extremely dangerous, we just didn't think about it. We were trained to respond, trained to evaluate other people, not us. Severe cold, some poor decisions, and a lack of management are what investigators believe led to that runaway train. Following the crash and explosion, authorities interviewed countless witnesses, crew members, and emergency personnel to piece it all together. MTN's Jacob Fuhrer tells us the final report and recommendations by the National Transportation Safety Board paint a detailed picture of the events of that day. Train 121 left Laurel, Montana, destined for Spokane, but it never made it. That morning on February 2nd, 1989, was bitter cold, much colder than when engineers and operators of the train left their home base of Missoula two days earlier. It was so dangerous in Montana and North Dakota that the governors of those two states closed all public schools until further notice. NBC's Roger O'Neill reports tonight. The weather also caused a Montana train wreck. To counteract the day's brutal temperatures, the crews on board had cranked up the heat on the lead helper unit. But the system became overloaded and shut down not long after passing through Helena. The lead train cabin quickly became even colder. Windows fogged up so much crews couldn't see outside. The decisions made after that power failure are what set the stage for disaster. Crews decided to make a stop here near Austin, about 11 miles outside of Helena. They planned to rearrange the front of the train to put a lead helper unit with working heat up front. They were making those changes when they got an indication that the rest of the train cars were missing. Now keep in mind it was pitch black at this time, so they turned on some train lights hoping to see those missing cars, but all they saw was darkness. Around 50 train cars rolled down the mountain, picking up speed and eventually careened down the tracks towards Helena, aided by the slope of the mountain. The train crews scrambled to follow the cars in their locomotive. The runaway cargo was said to have traveled 11 miles in around 12 to 13 minutes. It did eventually stop, only after crashing into three helper units stationed at the Benton Avenue crossing. Minutes later, an explosion rocked Helena. This is Audrey with Helena Police in Helena. We've had an explosion of a train. We need to know what was on that train. Three cars on the runaway train had contained flammable materials. In this case, uh, the uh, explosion was caused by an isopropyl alcohol tank car catching on fire after the uh, runaway train ran into a couple of helper engines. Uh, at the crossing. The hydrogen peroxide had a 70% concentration. Anything above 52 is considered greatly hazardous. The hydrogen peroxide tank car exploded with such a force that uh, Mike Stickney, the uh, state seismologist, told me it was picked up uh, on his uh, Richter scale in Butte was such a, an enormous above ground explosion. Only later did the NTSB uncover what happened that allowed the train cars to collide. The National Transportation Safety Board determined that the probable cause of this accident was the failure of the crews of train 121 to properly secure their train by placing the train brakes in emergency and applying hand brakes when it was left standing unattended on a mountain grade. Contributing to the accident was the decision of the engineer of Helper 2 to rearrange the locomotive consist and leave the train unattended on the mountain grade and the effects of the extreme cold weather on the air brake system of this train train and the crew members. Montana Rail Link declined to be interviewed for this story. In an emailed response, they did not directly address the events that occurred in 1989. In a statement, they said, quote, MRL exceeds industry standards and safety initiatives in many areas and has experienced an 86% reduction in accidents since 1997. The safety of our employees, customers and the public is our number one priority, end quote. As we've heard, the weather played a significant role in the disaster and the emergency response.
Meteorologist Curtis Grevenitz has more on the perfect storm of factors that brought bone chilling temperatures to Helena that February day. It was a day many never will forget because of weather that many never will forget. 30 degrees below zero, a wind chill of 70 below. Conditions alone were lethal without the explosion, fire, or toxic chemicals. The extreme weather was a national news story before the train explosion became a national story. Good evening. Well, if ever we wanted to prove that old saying, everybody talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it, this is the week. But then, what can be done about this bizarre pattern of spring conditions one day, Arctic cold the next? Today, that Siberian blast of cold air out of Alaska spread over a wide area of the lower 48. It was zero or below in 14 western and midwestern states today. This weather event was ranked number four on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's list of Montana's top weather events in the 20th century. At one point, the temperature remained colder than 20 below for 84 straight hours. A record low of 33 below zero occurred two days after the train explosion. A wind chill of 70 below can result in frostbite in less than five minutes. Life-threatening conditions impacted much of the community, but maybe none more than the first responders that raced toward the inferno. Fighting fire in such weather is unprecedented, but needed to be done. It's an incredible challenge fighting fire in the winter. Current Helena Fire Department Assistant Chief Mike Chambers was a high schooler in Helena at the time of the explosion. There is no way to prepare or train for the conditions firefighters faced that day. But our regulators on our masks will freeze, so our SCBAs become useless at that point. So that's an issue. Um, you know, just kind of cycling people in and getting them warm through the rehab process is a challenge. Um, it just makes things more difficult. It makes things harder. You got to manage the scene um, a little bit more actively. Um, you got to manage your equipment a lot more actively. Um, it's just, you know, it just adds another layer of complexity to a, to a situation that's already probably very dynamic. It was days before the fire was extinguished and chemicals removed, all through bitter cold. Even after the Arctic air loosened its grip on February 4th, the effects of the cold and the explosion were felt for a long time. Those guys that made it there that night, um, they were in for it. And it was, it was, it was a cold, long night. Um, they did their jobs. Um, you know, they served the citizens in this community as they should. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to follow in their footsteps. And I think uh, uh, all of the guys down at the fire station feel the same way. And um, if a situation or an incident like that ever happens again, um, we'll be coming and, and serving this community as, as those fellows did that day. Amazingly, no one was seriously injured as a result of the train crash or the explosion. But as MTN's Tim McGonigal reports, for one man working on the railroad that morning, his luck almost ran out more than once. It'll be with me the rest of my life every day. Mike McNellis had been working for MRL about two years on February 2nd, 1989, a day he and a co-worker were on what is known as a helper set. Their task, to switch to another track and get on the point of another train. But a near 70 below wind chill that frosty morning meant making the switch by hand with no idea of a runaway train headed their way. Helena Fire Department, uh, there's a train collision on uh, Benton Avenue or a train blew up. And when the train hit it, it thrusted the, the east locomotive the engineer was on towards me and I was right in the middle of the track stepping across and so I kind of froze and looked both ways, looked behind me and there he was coming at me. So I, I ran off the track to the north and then I looked back and I could hear all the cars derailing right behind me. So. I said to myself, don't stop running or your, your wife's going to be a widow. So, <laughs> After about 15 minutes, the pair made their way to the Benton Avenue crossing where they waited for other crew members to arrive. That's when Mike saw flames coming out of one of the derailed cars carrying hydrogen peroxide. Right after I said that, we all looked and, and then it, it exploded. They dove, well, they dove under the crew van and it just threw me out in the middle of Benton Avenue, right where that middle section is that wasn't there 30 years ago. Okay, we had a railroad car explode down here, possible toxic. Probably 15 feet in the air, and then uh, I got up and took a couple steps, and the second explosion threw me into the ditch about where we're standing. 
we've had an explosion of a train. I got We need to know what was on that train. And I just kind of landed right in there and curled up and hoped for the best. As metal fell all around him, Mike prayed it wasn't the end. It ain't, it ain't my time to go. I'm too young. I mean, uh, and I thought about Robin. I don't want her to be a widow after six months of marriage. I don't have any kids yet. Um, it's not my time. So, With his ears ringing and his eyes and nose burning, Mike went back to the station and eventually to the hospital. With power out all over town in an era long before smartphones, it would be hours before he could reach his wife, Robin. I know she told me later, she said, I knew you were involved. I just, I just knew it. As one of the few witnesses to the events of that early morning, Mike took exception to some local media accounts of what happened. I remember just two days after, if I remember right, that independent record had, this was an act of God that had happened. Um, and that frustrated me because I thought, there's, there's no way this was an act of God. They, I'm not here to bash anybody with the railroad that worked there at the time or anything, but things weren't done right up on the mall, uh, you know, in Austin with their train that came down and hit us. They said we were moving and we knew it was coming. We didn't know. Um, we tried to stop it. We were at a dead stop on our helper set right behind me. And they said it was, you know, hit us at seven, eight mile an hour. You can't derail 19 cars and do that much damage. So the incident left Mike with hearing damage that he lives with to this day. He would work for the railroad until 1996 and over time, would let go of any ill feelings against the company. And I had two, two daughters and I thought, you know what, I'm still here, I got, I got a family now. I, I can't dwell on it anymore. But the events of that morning are never far from his mind. I drive this Benton Avenue many times and I always, it always brings it back. Carroll College felt the brunt of the blast that morning. The train exploded just a few blocks away, blowing out windows and showering campus with debris. MTN's Andy Curtis tells us how the blast and the community's outpouring of support are still fresh in the minds of many who were at Carroll that day. It was kind of like a war zone. I still, I still think about the explosion and, and that day, and I still celebrate the miracle of, of of that that nobody got hurt. Much like the rest of the city, the students, faculty and staff of Carroll College awoke in the dark to confusion, panic and rumors, trying to make sense of what had just rocked campus. Uh, the, the original blast set off this chain reaction where then the transformers at the northwest uh, hub there uh, on uh, the gulch as it turns into cedar exploded and so I was looking right over at it so at that point I had no idea what was going on. People were coming out of their uh, dorm rooms and into the hall and trying to figure out what was going on mm -hmm. and so um, at that point we thought that maybe the boiler uh, on this building, St. Charles building, blew up. Even with no clear answers on what the chaos was Everyone jumped into action, almost out of instinct, with no protocol for a situation like this. Immediately, people um, started to come to my room to ask, especially in those days we called them RA, residence assistants, they're community assistants now. But uh, uh, they came down and I was able to call down to Guad to the, R, uh, to the community a resident director down there, Francie O'Reilly, and she said everything had exploded. Um, next thing that happened is Ed Noonan and the CAs uh, came up on our floor and uh, told us that uh, we were going to have to evacuate. Um, there was another explosion that took place after the initial explosion, and we still couldn't we couldn't figure out what was going on. And but we knew, you know, we knew that it was serious. <laughs> And he wasn't wrong. Many of the buildings around campus suffered severe damage, including Guadalupe Hall here behind me, which took the full force of the blast, knocking out windows, knocking out power, and making the hall unlivable. Now because of that and some of the extensive damage to the rest of the buildings on campus, students and faculty were then bused to various areas around town, like the Civic Center and the Armory. But those buildings didn't stay full for too long. A kind of an amazing part of the experience, Helen just showed up at the armory and, and said, what do you need or uh, can we take somebody home? And so by noon that day, everybody was uh, somewhere. The armory had 
by then had been cleared out. Uh, everybody seemed like they were okay. We started hearing stories from the girls that were there about what happened in Guad. And we were like, oh my gosh, we were just so shocked that you know, everybody got out of there. And as far as we knew, everybody was okay. And then as we were at the Civic Center, um, people were starting to show up from the community who were either like uh, um, a student had babysitted for or were connected uh, through sports or whatever. And um, students were being taken to uh, community uh, homes. Housing for the displaced saints wasn't the only way Carol found help. As former boiler engineer Butch Biskubiak quickly found out, businesses jumped at the chance to help lend a hand. My day that time, I worked 47 hours straight. We were going from building to buildings. We had people from the city. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, UBC back then showed up with a huge truckload of plywood and just dumped it behind Guad for us uh, to board up, you know, start boarding up windows and stuff like that. The community outreach was amazing. What was even more amazing was the fact that even with the widespread destruction, there were no injuries, but instead a strengthened bond between the school and the community. We know that the Helena community will always be there for us, and Carroll College will always be there for the Helena community. And so that's really something that I still celebrate to this day. To never underestimate a people's ability to rise to a crisis. The very fact that from all corners of the campus and the community, people almost automatically tried to do something. When people are put to the test, good things can happen. Journalists from Helena's television and radio station and newspaper worked many long hours to inform the community about what was happening. MTN's Jonathan Ambarian shares their memories. The enormous explosion the morning of February 2nd, 1989, immediately got the attention of people across Helena. Local journalists were no exception. My wife and I woke from a sound sleep by this tremendous boom. I found myself thinking, wow, what was that? <laughs> that, that was something big. MTN chief political reporter Mike Dennison was then working for the Associated Press. He was one of the first reporters to arrive at the scene. You can just tell right away, that was a major explosion. He remembers walking out into the field where Carroll College's Nelson Stadium now stands and finding chunks of black metal thrown by the blast. But I've been out there maybe five minutes, ten minutes tops and just thought, I gotta get out of here, I can't be here, it's just too cold. While Dennison was getting his information ready for the wire, television news crews were gathering dramatic footage of the aftermath. Ian Marquand was the news director and anchor for KTVH. He and camera operator Jeff Hatley first arrived at the Benton Avenue crossing. It was just as if a train had stopped at the crossing. The gates were down, the lights were on, the bells were ringing. We couldn't see very much here. There was a lot of vapor in the air. Longtime KTVQ anchor Jay Cohn was then the Capitol Bureau chief for MTN. I do remember driving through town, there was no lights anywhere. It knocked power out to almost the whole entire city. Authorities were giving him a closer look at the crash site when a National Guard helicopter came overhead. And on their speaker was saying, vacate the area immediately. When the helicopter hovers over your head and tells you to vacate the area, there's a pretty good chance you're going to do that. As the day went on, reporters scattered across Helena, talking to evacuated residents and Carroll students and surveying the damage. Greg Pace usually shot commercials for KTVH, but he spent the day covering the news, getting footage of businesses with shattered windows and authorities trying to manage the situation. You go out and you see something like this and something has happened to your town and you just get this adrenaline rush and it's like, wow, it's, this, this isn't like going and shooting a commercial. The bitter cold was always an obstacle. At that time, TV reporters were using large video cameras that recorded onto three-quarter inch tapes like this, attached to their cameras with long cords. What I remember is that umbilical cord became a hard pretzel in about 10 seconds. I could only shoot about 30 seconds at a time because the battery would die. Just getting tired carrying that, you tended to not always think about your frozen fingers and toes. At KTVH, the power outage left the station without heat for much of the morning. The transmitter got so cold, it went off the air. Now eventually, it came on enough that we could at least get an audio signal out. So as soon as that happened, we tried to gather up as much uh, written information as we could. I went in the studio, and I basically did a radio newscast. 
Throughout the day, reporters expected to hear news of deaths or major injuries. But to their surprise, no one had been seriously hurt. Whenever people recall it, I think that they do kind of do so with kind of a, a, a smile of wonder or amazement on their faces, just going, God, we just can't believe it, uh, how this happened. The day after the explosion, journalists were invited back to see what was left at the scene. The wreckage of the cars was covered in snow and ice because of all the water that had been sprayed to put out the fire. It looked like somewhere on the North Pole or nothing like Helena, Montana. Amid the hard news of those days, there were also stories of the Helena community coming together and neighbors helping neighbors. Helena takes care of its own. They really do. You know, this is a place that you care for each other. and. Uh, that's, that's what happened here. In the minutes and hours after the blast, there was a lot of uncertainty for members of the community living or working on Helena's west side. Here's what some of them recall from that day in their own words. Among the areas sustaining damage were the Lundy Center and Euclid Avenue. And, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars worth of damage. Keith Clevenger of the Staggering Ox Sandwich Shop in the Lundy Center was devastated by the destruction. Two windows are out, half our ceiling came down. Somebody will bring up a story about something and I'll say, oh yeah, well, <laughs> we got a better one than that. We really had lived through a winter and what a winter that was. <laughs> never experienced anything like that before and have never experienced anything since. All of a sudden, there was this huge bang. I looked out my window in time to watch all the lights of the town just go clunk, 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 clunk. I sat bolt upright in bed and I looked out to these um, windows that I couldn't see out, but I could see this glow. I woke up to this horrendous metal on metal squealing. And at that point I went, well, waterbed's not going to be warm much longer, so I might as well soak it up while I can. Well, we're all piled up in bed, you know, we're going to be okay, and so we all just sort of went back to sleep. My brother-in-law was a firefighter and he had been called out to the scene, and he called them to let us know that um, it was within our our parameters and that we probably needed to um, vacate. I didn't get out of bed till we had uh, our neighbor at Ben Franklin. He came up to see us and say, you better get down to your shop. Eight o'clock, the phone rang and I jumped out of bed and it was my mother in Kansas City. Are you okay? Are you okay? I said, what do you mean? I had forgotten that there was, you know, some crash or something. And she said, well, there was a terrible train wreck. Officials think a coupler failed. Uh, and it's all over the news. When I came down here, I walked right through these front windows and came in and all the plants looked just as beautiful as the night we saw them last. And I went up and touched a leaf on one and it just shattered in my hands. Every, every plant we had is, is dead and there were over 200 of those. So that's gonna be six to $8,000. Our son was about seven, eight months old then and he was on medication for um, having trouble breathing. When you hear that there's a dangerous chemical in the air and um, could cause respiratory problems and stuff, um, we panicked. We were pretty absorbed in just making heads or tails out of the mess we had here. We loaded up everything, um, you know, that we needed for a couple of days and left and went over to my parents' house. You can really see the, the, the warmth of the community when those kinds of things happen. And as it turned out, everybody in town found out all our plants died, so we got all everybody's orphans and strays, so we kind of repopulated the place quite quickly. Helena, you know, certainly does show its support and um, people open their homes and it's what you would expect. We'd like to thank Montana Disaster and Emergency Services, the Helena Police and Fire Departments, the Lewis and Clark County Sheriff's Office, and everyone who sat down to talk to us for this special. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.